the extent to which surveillance exacerbates power asymmetries is just massive. Like you have some baseline asymmetry of power. First and foremost comes from like the government's ability to lock you up and send you to prison. And surveillance basically massively amplifies those power asymmetries. Privacy is, is sort of a necessary mechanism to preserve some set of independence from these like very powerful things. Most of the positive progress that we've had in privacy is all of the technology. And it what like, demonstrates largely that relatively small groups of software engineers can have an enormous and outsized impact on the available privacy to very large numbers of people. Welcome to Foresight's Intelligent Corporation Group. And this is a special seminar series sponsored by Zcash Foundation and the Zcash community. So thank you so, so much for that. We've had really, really wonderful folks on in the past already including Andrew Miller, Zuko, then the previous one was Marta Belcher, and really just like a few experts on A, telling us a bit of like, why is privacy so undervalued in our lives? Not just because it's important, but also because privacy preserving, machine learning, privacy preserving other applications, they just also unlock a few new use cases that were otherwise not possible before. So we first talk a little bit about like, the individual reasons for why we may want it, then afterwards about a few exciting applications that are in the realm already happening. So now today I'm incredibly excited to have Zaki here. Zaki and I have met multiple times in person. Last time, I think at Vision Weekend in San Francisco, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, you've been a really wonderful, I think, addition to our various foresight panels whenever we had the chance to collaborate with you. So thank you so, so much for joining this Shielded Transaction Special. Really, really appreciate it. You have a pretty deep background. I first wanted to have ChatGPT4 generate an intro for you because they're usually quite fun, but it got too many things wrong. So I just totally let it be. It created a different persona. Makes me very curious what ChatGPT4 thinks about me. You want me to read it out? It thinks that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me, tell me, tell me what ChatGPT4 yeah, so thinks Zaki is. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and distinguished guests, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce you our keynote speaker for today's event, Mr. Zaki Manian, a true visionary in the field of cryptography, privacy technologies, and AI. Mr. Manian has dedicated his career to advancing the cause of privacy and security in the digital age. So far, so good. His profound understanding of these complex issues and his unwavering commitment to the development of innovative solutions have earned him worldwide recognition as an expert in the rapidly evolving field. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science from MIT wrong, has, has worked extensively in academia and industry, has contributed to the development of cutting-edge privacy preserving technologies such as homomorphic encryption, secure multi-party computation, and differential privacy. Not really. I know. And then it just goes on. <laughs> I mean, it's a really flattering. It's a flattering. Yeah, I, that's maybe there's another, there's another Zaki Munian out there. Potentially. Or it's something that you Or could, it's from a parallel universe where I went to MIT. It's you from the future. I think it's encouraging you to. No, no, no. it's definitely a parallel universe because I, 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 I could have gone to MIT and like the whole my whole life would have taken a whole different direction. That's true. So a different universe. Anyway, that other Zaki, we also have to get him on the podcast. Exciting what he's working on too. But now we're really delighted to have you on for now. And yeah, so your from work. this universe, from, from as far as I know. So we think, unless it's a simulation too. But why don't you start us off with telling us a little bit about yourself and in particular, how you got into uh, the general space of crypto and then in particular, how you started caring about privacy. Was that kind of ingrained in you from the get-go or was there a particular event when you realized, oops, this is rather important and we should be paying more attention? So, okay, like sort of the, the basic biographical details. I'm like from the Silicon Valley. I grew up in Palo Alto. Went to the University of Pennsylvania, did not study computer science, studied history of science, was in biotech for eight years, taught myself how to program, built a bunch of stuff with like lasers, like lasers, cell biology, that kind of stuff, all kinds of fancy microscopes and whatnot. Then I, then what happened was about 2012 ish, I started to get both sort of bored with biotech and how slowly things were moving and curious about other things. And one of the insights that I had was 
oh, like all of this code that I've been writing for the last 10 years, I think it's all like horribly insecure. It, it is horribly insecure. And I've been and building all of these like medical and life science systems. It seems bad. So then I got curious about what was going on in the field of security. I was also, I've also been very concerned about mass surveillance and in general power dynamics in the world. And the world does seem to be sort of spiraling towards some form of AI totalitarianism. Uh, and that has become even more pressing and obvious in the last few months. But, you know, that was kind of my sense of the world. And I was like, okay, what can you do in the world to sort of be a force against AI totalitarianism? And so that got me interested in sort of private communication, internet privacy, things like Signal, things like Tor. Then I got interested in cryptocurrencies uh, and that led to this question of like, how do you build sort of fair digital markets using blockchains as technology, which I think has been basically the work of the last 10 years of my life. And so now, and like a big, it's very difficult, if not impossible to have fair digital markets without forms of financial privacy. Uh, and so then privacy becomes sort of a means to an end and to that, to that end. And so then I've been, so those are all of the different pieces of, of technology that I've gotten been interested in, been excited about. I think privacy is pretty much like digital privacy is the only alternative to sort of this idea of governments and corporation and like monopoly corporations empowered by very sophisticated machine learning systems starting to control every aspect of human life. Okay, wonderful. Now I want to dive deeper into a few of the threads that you mentioned, if you don't mind. So to double click a bit on them. First one, maybe let's start with the insecure bio applications. There has been a lot of really interesting work recently on using homomorphic encryption or federated machine learning for privacy preserving progress in healthcare. And so I feel recently with cryptography, at least we're making a bit of progress, but like what in particular are you worried about if it comes to like biotechnologies and, and, and loss of privacy? I mean, so specifically for the, so there's, it's been like the, the, so quality of software engineering in general, like most software that is written in the world is, is, is terribly, is, is like poorly implemented, poorly tested, poorly constructed, has terrible paradigms around authentication is frequently, many of it is uh, until recently, most things were written in memory, unsafe languages that once you connect them to networks would immediately like are immediately exploitable and subvertible. And so like most software has been operating on mostly like a security by obscurity, or it's just not like worth it for anyone to bother to compromise it approach to security rather than any sort of actual secure software engineering practices. And you've, so I think that's, that's sort of the status quo of the world. And that basically means that like simply once you want to compromise some, assuming you have some motivation, to compromise something, you can get at it, get at the data. And there's lots of motivations that have emerged for people wanting to compromise systems in life science laboratories and in, in, in like medical facilities and stuff like that, like patient data has become incredibly valuable for things like intelligence services who are looking for people like, for instance, who have a lot of medical debt, people want insight, countries want insight into drug development. They want to be able to steal IP, intellectual property, like all of these things are huge problems. And so it's sort of interesting. It's like, it's, it's, it's cool that there's interest in applying sort of very state of the art techniques in places like life science, like cryptographic techniques, like fully homomorphic encryption and stuff like that. But like the baseline security of many of these systems is incredibly poor, yet it touches lots of sensitive and life critical data. And then, but there's a flip side to this, which is, uh, biology can be incredibly privacy invasive. Like for instance, we leave our genomes basically everywhere we go. We just shed skin cells and are leaving like a cloud of our genetic material everywhere we go. Not just our, most, but that of our family. Exactly. Your, your ancestors and your descendants, right? And like generally the reasons why there haven't been 
devices and like police cars and whatnot that'll just like ambiently sequence, grab fingerprint people's DNA just by sniffing the air and just seeing who was there has mostly been because software engineering in biotech is so terrible. I've seen the code of the gene sequencers and it is truly awful. And the, and so it's somewhat been also preserving some degree of privacy around things that are like largely unsolvable privacy problems. Another, another thing I think a lot about from a privacy point of view though, is so, you know, I've been working in sort of privacy advocacy for about 10 years, started an organization called the Restore the Fourth, the Restore the Fourth Amendment, which is the, the sort of most privacy association of U.S. constitutional amendments and the, which is that the government cannot surveil you or seize things from you without a warrant from a judge. And the, like, I have, I mostly watch us basically fail on meat space privacy. And it does seem like meat space, like in the real world, privacy is like an unsolvable problem. When we started this, we start, we, we like very, we worked on this in, we put an enormous amount of effort into getting, banning the use of facial recognition by the San Francisco police department. But this ended up being entirely pointless because ring doorbells became a global, like a universal facial recognition surveillance network that were everywhere. And the police just query that database. Like they don't use their own surveillance cameras really as much anymore. And so the, the, the march of technology has been about basically a level of physical privacy loss that is just enormous at the same time, like our only real place where we have privacy now is like in our computers, in our phones, in signal, in Tor, in private, in private financial systems. Uh, that's interesting that you mentioned meat space privacy and reminds me of David Brin's book, The Transparent Society, just because he was really arguing for the fact that eventually we will all have sensors or like video cameras. I'm not sure if you actually talked about the cameras and the, and the doorbells, but like for sure the ones you know, on our bodies, in our phones and so forth. And so basically saying like we will just by default be creating this kind of like multipolar surveillance rather than like a surveillance network in which we kind of monitor each other. Nevertheless, that probably being better than if we, uh, if we had top-down surveillance. And maybe even that would allow us to kind of compensate a bit for the top-down surveillance that's already happening in a relatively asymmetric way. What do you think about that? Do you think it's... I think it was, ex is, is an ex... I remember at least being familiar with ideas. I don't know if I read the book many years ago, but it's, it, it honestly is like hopelessly naive now knowing, like living in the world that I, I live in. Like the power, like the extent to which surveillance ex exacerbates power asymmetries is just massive. Like you have some baseline asymmetry of power, mostly because like the government that first and foremost comes from like the government's ability to lock you up and send you to prison. And surveillance basically massively amplifies those power asymmetries. And that is the nature of, and like privacy is, is sort of a necessary mechanism to preserve individual sovereignty and the ability and some set of some set of independence from these like very powerful entities. Yeah, I, I guess his point was also that like surveillance top down is already happening, but you know, with the surveillance component of each of us monitoring each other, we're also watching the watchers more uh, by default. <laughs> There's still the power imbalance of what can we do about it. <laughs> But exactly. um, yeah, it, it was also not necessarily super book on this outlook. It was just saying it's probably going to happen. <laughs> and here we are. Here we are. Okay, wonderful. I mean, we could really dive into that, I think, much, much more. But I think maybe to just take a brief pause for maybe a positive interlude. Do you think, what's there to be done about it? Are you still working on the Restore the Four? I still work on Restore the Fourth. I wouldn't. I would say, I mean, it's a great group of people. It's a great community. I think that like we've had some, a number of successes, but it's, it's, like, it's, it's like you're standing in front of this wave. That is a, it, it is somewhat of an overwhelming force. I do think that like most of the positive progress that we've had in privacy has all been technological. Like all of this would be a hundred X worse if like signal didn't exist. It'd all be a hundred X worse if zero knowledge proof technology had 
been developed and industrially adopted. And what we are doing is what we're like, so, I mean, it's been a huge, I mean, the, the fact that like the signal protocol and end-to-end -end encrypted messaging got deployed to like billions of users, the fact that like privacy preserving financial primitives actually exist. These and are funded by capital markets. These are huge accomplishments and it, and it like demonstrates largely that like relatively small groups of software engineers can make, can have an enormous and outsized impact on like the available privacy to very large numbers of people. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. I think, yeah, progress through technology is, I, mean, I think, the best way to just create new technological realities that then the other environment has to adapt to in this, like, never-ending offense-defense <laughs> dynamic. But I think, like, one really interesting bit is just the point that, like, Chris just pointed out in the chat is also this kind of asymmetry because the government's budget is just, like, pretty limitless. And there has recently been at least, like, some worries in relationship to AI that the fact that... <laughs> China soon won't really have access to really good GPUs anymore to do their training runs. Uh, plus the fact that China is already prohibiting things like ChatGPT and is kind of like now cut off from the race a little bit may make vulnerability, computer vulnerabilities in OpenAI, Anthropic and all the other AI labs much more juicy a target for China. And like the fact that the Chinese government has such a big budget versus the government yeah. is that companies have to fix these flaws. Like uh, you, you assume one. that the Chinese government has the GPT-4 weights, right? Like you would assume uh -huh. that that is true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm more worried about also the geopolitical risk that would come from like an overt offensive action via the, the Chinese government because technically the, that is a, yeah, that, that is a real threat of war on, on their behalf. And I'd argue you should, should be treated as that by the U.S. government. So I'm more worried about in-strike instabilities in that regard and so forth. But it's still theoretical at this point. But I do think that security and privacy for that matter also should really be more on the forefront of folks working in AI and especially in long-term yeah, paths towards AGI. Do you have any musings about that? I mean... I think in a world where everything is like where AI was never going, was always going to exist or like AI was an impossibility or did not exist and like progress was not so rapid. I think the motivations for cryptography and the motivations for cryptography for building cryptocurrency is for building blockchains would, would be weaker. I've always really felt the, uh, like the work in cryptocurrency was like in a race with, with the AI development. And we're basically, we're doing well enough that there's like a glimmer of hope for sort of a, I think like the, to me, the question with AGI has always been, it's sort of this question of like, when do humans stop being the protagonists of the earth, right? When do we, we stop being like the, the prime movers and when do, do AIs become the prime movers? And then what, how do, how do humans interact with a world where systems? So would you say recent, I mean, I think there has been definitely a speed up in privacy preserving technologies recently. I mean, I mean, I would say more than it's speed up. I mean, I think privacy preserving technologies like. I remember the first presentation of Zero Cash that I saw at our tiny little cryptocurrency meetup in Mountain View from Iran and Turmeric. When was it? That was, I want to say that was 2014. And the kinds of things that we can do now with zero knowledge proofs were the kinds of things that felt like they, at the time, were like 30 years away. And so it was right. We have achieved like a, and like, I mean, the same thing is true with like, homomorphic encryption, and then there's also this rapid move forward in end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. And the, the fact that the, the large tech companies are in many ways villains of privacy. They built their models on this like map business models on these massive surveillance systems, but they've also really gone to bat for end-to-end -end encrypted messaging on, for the most part. 
Uh, yeah, and the, the surprising thing is not Zeki about the the speed of arrival of end to end encryption on a video is how long it took us to get past PGP, which we had this technology that was wonderful technology. And we knew that it was just completely unusable. And yeah. now we've got end to end encrypted video all over the place. Yeah, Moxie and Trevor did it. Yeah, they like they were like it, it, I mean it was and it was like it was like it was like maybe 10 people right who who collectively changed the course of the basic assumptions of human communication and that that to me is a incredibly positive thing yeah it's the actions by really a small group of people so you already mentioned that you think that privacy meet space is maybe lost privacy in the, in the digital space could relatively well be preserved. I'm super curious. You already touched on Signal, obviously, but, you know, in the perhaps like financial space and so forth, like what are a few like recent developments slash projects that you're really excited about and that you think are like just really changing the pace, the pace of progress recently? Yeah, I think like one of the biggest. So, I mean, a lot has been happening in the, in the, in the privacy space in general in cryptocurrencies, right? So 2014, you get this presentation of this paper, zero cash and presentation of the proposed protocol. And then astoundingly, you get a production implementation just about 18 months later, which is just mind boggling in the history of cryptography. Uh, and then, but the other thing that is very true, right, is the zero knowledge proof technology, This, which is this like fundamental primitive that enables sort of privacy preserving financial, because it basically allows you to prove like, what's the point of why is your knowledge proofs important? Well, traditionally in blockchains, like the sort of conventional way a blockchain works is you publish all of the data and you show all the computation and everybody repeats the computations. But if you want to compute on hidden data, you need to be able to show that your computations are correct without showing the data that was the input. Zero knowledge proofs allow us to show that computations are correct either over fully public inputs or a mixture of public and private inputs. And it turns out that that is like the key piece to enabling authenticated, private, scalable transactions. One thing though, that has been very true is though, as a practical matter, the adoption of privacy, privacy preserving protocols on top of zero knowledge proofs has been actually like lag behind just using that for scalability. Because the traditional way a blockchain works is that every blockchain repeats all of the computations of every other blockchain. But if you have these proofs and the proofs can be verified much more quickly than the, than repeating the computations, you can scale your blockchain by, instead of sharing like all of the transactions of the data, you show a proof that I, I, I proved that like this input was tra and transformed into this output. And I just show you the proof so you don't have to repeat all of the computations. That has been much more successful. So we say like succinctness has been much more successful than privacy using the zero knowledge cryptography. But the success of succinctness has enabled a massive amount of funding into these cryptographic primitives, which has driven an enormous amount of maturity. And now we're starting to see so many pieces of technology now that work out of the box that are relatively mature, that pe more and more people are starting to now experiment with trying to find product market fit for privacy. And so I'm very excited about lots of different things that I have, uh, protocols I like contribute to, have been invested in, happening in the wider cryptocurrency space that are now taking all of these like state of the art new cryptographic primitives and like trying to find use cases that will convince users that they should interact with privacy. We've also had the first time that the U.S. government has actually sanctioned with Tornado Cash a privacy-preserving primitive. And so there's this whole like legal compliance aspect of it as well. And then you have the developer of one of these privacy-preserving who has been sitting in jail in the Netherlands for six months approximately without charges. And so there, the, 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 the conflict over financial privacy seems to be just beginning. And like the stakes seem to have been raised enormously by like the maturing of the technology. 
yeah, what what's there to do? Do you think it's just building better tech? Do you think there is something to be done of trying to engage with legislators? Do you think it's something else? I think there's two things. I think one is trying to make privacy just much more pervasive throughout the cryptocurrency industry period, such that it feels it, it, it doesn't seem like cryptocurrency and privacy are separate. Um, right now, I think the, in the eyes of many regulators and sort of administrative authorities, they are like, we could have blockchains and cryptocurrencies, but without privacy. And the more we push on blockchain interoperability, extensibility, programmability, the closer we get to the point where it becomes clear that blockchains and privacy are not things that are separate. Like you can only, you can only have one or them together. And that then forces a choice about whether or not you want sort of these, then it becomes just a fight against, you know, it's, it's, do you want centralized digital, centralized digital markets or decentralized digital? Yeah, I guess like one benefit to that is just that there's this kind of inherent benefit of at least some, I guess, zero knowledge just properties that they also allow better scalability and so forth. So it's not just that there's a reason to implement this within the blockchain space because it's privacy preserving, but also just because you can really just build better stacks. And and I think that that could be made more clear and that could be yeah. you know, exploited a bit more. And I think the other piece is we want more actors and markets to to sort of express that they, that really these markets only work with privacy. That like finance only really works with privacy. And the more privacy feels seems essential, the less likely it is, is that forces will be arrayed to remove. Wonderful. We already have two participant questions. First, Sam, then Michael. Thanks, Allison. It's like you could see you. I just wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts regarding trusted execution environments or confidential states and how does that play a role in the in the bigger picture that you're they are drawing for a future of decentralized financial infrastructure yeah. powered by zk and so on trusted execution environments are so are this are this primitive by which you instead of using math and like math and information theory to hide information you use like the process of designing and manufacturing computer chips. This system though has, has run into this pr c consistent problem, which is it turns out that we're really bad at making secure computer chips. I have very, I was dead. I, so there were these two famous vulnerabilities in C in modern CPUs, Spectre and Meltdown that cropped up in the summer of, I believe, 2017. It was, became public, I believe, the in January of 2018. But a lot of people simultaneously discovered or started noticing that there were potential security vulnerabilities here. And I was definitely in groups of people who were noticing these things. And, you know, and then all of that has resulted in a sort of, uh, sort of never ending sequence of security exploits against the most prominent trusted execution environment, SGX. So what does all of that mean? It means that like right now, SGX is, is so for a lot of things we, or for a lot of things that people desire to do, we don't really have a cryptographic primitive that's viable other than SGX. So like for a lot of the work, for instance, that I do and that I'm interested in what's called the minor or maximal extracted value, but like the process by which, like, which is like one of the biggest privacy problems in cryptocurrencies today, which is that like, when you want to transact on a blockchain between when you publish your transaction and when your transaction is actually included in the blockchain, prices can be changed. The states of various markets and smart contracts can evolve and you can essentially get worse prices or because of this like lack of privacy. And we are as an industry trying to figure out various ways of managing that. And all of this requires sort of private computation that can be done in a lot on like very large amounts of data, let's say the entire blockchain state and needs to be done very quickly. 
And there really isn't a compelling alternative other than there's nothing that like anything that seems near term viable other than trusted hardware, like secure har like hardware. So my general point of view on it is we should try to rely on cryptography as much as possible, but there are certain things that we have no choice but to build using TEEs. And so they're like an incredible, they're a very important part of the story of building sort of provably fair digital markets. Thanks. Micah. I had a different question. This is on the topic of TEEs and transition. I feel like the bigger problem with trusted execution environments is they're premised on this root of trust in the chip manufacturer and their supply chains and everything. Like if, if someone gets a hold of the, whatever the key generator for SGX, they can say, oh, I did this execution. Here's my proof, but it's not, they didn't actually do the execution, right? Like they can spoof any proof they want. And so right now, Intel has that ability and presumably anybody who has the power to pressure Intel has that ability, yep. which is US, maybe China, maybe wherever the chips are manufactured. And so I feel like that my biggest problem with the trust execution environments is just, it feels like we're just back to trusting the government, which historically has not done well for us, I feel. I mean, I think there's a, just absolutely an element of truth in, in all of that. They're simply the properties of cryptographic privacy are like the trust properties of cryptography of, of systems that are built out of math are in it are ultimately always superior to the trust properties of systems that are built out of silk. Securing hardware supply chains is immensely difficult. The, and there, there, there are like real risks to all of this stuff. But what I was trying to sketch out was that you now, if you have, let's say, a fully public transaction supply chain right now, which is what we have today, if you add SGX, that's strictly a privacy improvement. Is even even if the government, you run into an interesting thing, which is, let's say, because the government's not going to go and front run you for $1,000, right? Like they may have compromised this SGX. They may actually be able to see all of your transactions, but they're still not actually going to operate on them. So you, like... Your like privacy is not an app is generally not an absolute privacy is always exists within that threat model. Um, and so I don't think that I think, for instance, if all you're trying to do is achieve front running protection by, uh, for like in a general purpose computing environment by SGX, you have a reasonable argument that at least government level actors are not, even if they have access to the information are not going to do anything that harms you using it. it but like the problem that you have with the sort of generalized insecurity of silicon is that it it's not so much that like that like you might have compromise from like the government state level actor but you know it does get into the realm of your competitor in a marketplace and a competing trading firm etc might actually be able to exploit these vulnerabilities to get a trading advantage and then that defeats the purpose of the system right so my actual question that i meant to ask was do you think privacy has is far enough along either culturally or technologically that it could survive western governments banning it so if the us and europe decided that they wanted to require backdoors and all security and they succeeded at passing that legislation and they sanctioned all private finance do you think that there's enough critical mass that we can survive that or do you think that would be a death blow to privacy globally so i think the biggest problem is actually is is the biggest problem with with this whole system is that like our software supply chains so like we basically have like to most of the users world's computer users we have two app stores the apple app store and the google app store for distributing software at scale and not only does the software have to be distributed at scale, but you need like error reporting, bug reporting, like all of that stuff. There's this whole bi-directional mechanism that needs to exist in order to deploy consumer software at large scale. And I suspect that the like actual choke point on privacy is not like we're going to ban the open source code. We're going to ban the, and this is generally true for DeFi, right? It's like, 
the governments want to ban DeFi, the easiest place is to ban what goes in the app stores. Ban what goes on the app stores, maybe go after the people who are running websites. And if people can want to compile a user interface or run it on their own computer, that world, okay, so now it's just this fringe activity that only a few people do. That's probably the biggest area of concern. And with this like online safety bill that's happening in the, which is essentially like an end-to-end -end encryption ban in disguise that's happening in the UK and similar things that are happening in the EU. These are, and so one of the things though, that like end-to-end -end messaging does have is it has broad widespread consumer adoption. Um, and at least people will know if their if signal disappears from their app store, there'll be like enough people to have it, that people will be aware. I mean, the worst possible outcome in terms of loss of privacy is for you to lose privacy without knowing that you lost privacy, where it's like invisible to people that, that they've lost privacy. And I think, and so there is definitely a race against time with privacy and financial transactions to get to a large enough adoption base that at least if it was taken away from people, people would notice. And perhaps in terms of financial privacy, you really recently joined the Technical Advisory Board of Zcash as well in 2020, is that correct? Yeah. And then I'm, I've been on the, I'm also on the board of Electric Coin Company or the Bootstrap, which is the foundation that owns the Electric Coin. So I've been involved in the Zcash community for a long time. So what, you know, is happening in that community in this kind of like race towards trying to make it end, carve out a space or really just roll out and, and, and make more, yeah, make more applicable most of the kind of like privacy design technologies we could be using for financial transactions. Yeah. So as I mentioned, there's been like sort of, I think there's been like a couple of challenges. There, so there's, there's been this real challenge, which is that you've had blockchains that have enabled privacy like Monero and Zcash. And then, and they've been like islands while these sort of empires of, of blockchains like Solana, Ethereum, Cosmos, Polkadot sort of formed, right? And so you had privacy in these islands, and then you had uh, these like sort of hegemonic structures that are forming. And Zcash has really made a priority out of trying to figure out how do they stop being, how do they become part of the sort of larger blockchain structure? And so Cosmos has this emphasis on interoperability and composability between different blockchains. And there's been this very exciting and sort of program that has, so there's one project that I have been involved in called Anoma Namada, and there's Zcash. And Namada actually is proposing both an airdrop, i.e. a delivery of coins to people who are users of the Zcash's privacy applications or like privacy protocols, i.e. people who keep their coins in a private state on Zcash. And then they want to also bridge between Zcash and Nomada, which would then bridge them into Cosmos, which would bridge them from Cosmos to everything else, Ethereum, Polkadot, everything else there's, is reachable. Like once you kind of get off the island, you connect into these like large number of trade routes. And I think that's probably the most promising way of getting privacy like deeply integrated into cryptocurrency and cryptocurrency finance. So much more interoperability. And so if, let's say I'm new to crypto, I'm listening to this, how can I help this effort? There are like relatively kind of practical, pragmatic action items that projects I can contribute to or like specific kind of like apps, tools, integrations I can help build. What are specific applications, apps, tools that you could help build? But just in general, as a newbie entering the field, if, if I... I if I agree with what you said, how can I, how can I help? How can you help? So I guess one of the things that I was, so I just, so there's this, so I was just at ZK Hack and ZK Summit, which were uh, uh, the first, this is the first in-person ZK Hack, which is the first, as far as we know, we think possibly the first in-person zero knowledge focused hackathon. And, and so one of the things that was so su most surprising to me is like how many people were able to build something in just 48 hours before. Uh, we've had previous online ZK hackathons and none of them were 48 hours. They were all longer and it was still really hard to build like an end, an actual application. The zero knowledge. So if you have like a tech background, 
there's actually like a lot of tools to play with right now. A lot of ideas, a lot of products to prototype. Because I do think like, I do like the biggest, the biggest thing that's missing right now is product market fit is, is, is stuff in the ZK space and then the privacy space. That's really, really compelling to use. And I think I, 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 that is, that is the, that is probably the biggest contribution that everyone can make. It's like trying to figure out like what uses of privacy will actually be so compelling that people will, will use them at scale. Yeah, that sounds like a valuable bit. And in terms of electric coin companies, future plans and so forth, are there any specific projects that you're excited about? Any bits that people can contribute to or yeah, any kind of next steps to, to make progress in this area? So the biggest sort of pro points of progress among uh, on Zcash lately have been just sort of shoring up the cryptographic basis of the system. This is like this, the, the, the in general story has been like, in, improve the cryptography, improve the cryptography, improve. The It's just now that we're starting to see you use the cryptography for like more and more complicated things. And so, yeah, I mean, there's just an enormous desire to like really figure out and participate in this interoperability piece. I think the interoperability piece is going to be a big lift for Zcash, but that was a big part of the reason why I joined the board was to help to support interoperability. And it is, I think it's been very heartening for the Zcash team to actually see an external team actually trying to meet them in the Awesome. Are there a few like upcoming challenges that you think are like pretty worrying to you? Either we already touched a few on like what's been happening lately in the legislative and in terms of like imprisoning people, literally. But are there any kind of like future threats of you are now panning out from, from now into the next five years or something? There's a lot to build. We talked about the fact that interoperability should really be a key. We talked about the fact that usability and actually getting people to like really universally adopt these technologies so that they really have skin in the game and their continued existence. Those two are, I think, like really big carrots amongst the, uh, along the next five years. But what are kind of like potential risks that uh, kind of could, could could heal that? You already talked a bit about mass surveillance in particular enabled by AI, but are there any other things that we should, you, you think we should be prepping against kind of as we, yeah, as we move into the next five years? Yeah, what is, what is the digital prepper lifestyle? I think the other, I think the other probably biggest threat is this like sort of like surveillance in the endpoint. So like sort of the way that governments seem to have caught on to, okay, so there's widespread general demand for encrypted end-to-end -end encrypted communication. Okay. Well, they're like, we accept it. Okay. Then therefore we should be able to compel people's like devices to like scan for objectionable content. And we will always start out these conversations with child abuse because child abuse is, is child abuse is the most horrible. Like when you build these privacy technologies, it, it, it does, that is a community that, or that is a use case, or I don't know, it's a horror. It's like a toxic waste associated with building privacy technologies that it inevitably becomes part of crime like tornado cash the other side of it was that like north korea effectively became like this horrible abusive slave state that has tens of millions of people enslaved within it became like the bigger use biggest user of of the of tornado cash. there are really socially awful users of of these technology of these privacy technologies it is it is just a fact of, of life but the undermining it's like we should not give up like independent human thought and like human sovereignty for the task of eliminating the ability of people to trade child sexual abuse materials or to to fight nuclear proliferation because it sort of defeats the entire purpose of trying to achieve those ends right because the purpose is that humans are like us are exist and thrive and so all i would say is the biggest thing is as a society we have to not let our fear of all of these bad actors of the technology sort of undermine the use case and that like we need to strongly incur preserve the idea that like 
your device operates with your interests in mind and is not subverted by like the sort of wider interests of the government for surveillance and other use cases. Yeah, I mean, I think the the sad fact is just that the downsides of privacy preserving technologies are really like out there in the open, but the downsides of non-privacy preserving technologies are like kind of like a death by a thousand stitches. And once you realize that it's lost, it's too late. <laughs> It's this kind of thing that is a looming thread that really only the folks who've lost it, which are not many of us, at least like here in the same sense and a few other folks who really have to kind of bear the consequences of that, like that, that really hurts. But at that point, it's too late. <laughs> and so I think there's this asymmetry really that, that we have to kind of like work uphill against. But yeah, that was, I think, a really nice steel manning of, of the other ones like of, of the against privacy position, but also really making an appeal to, hey, on the long one, though, this is no this is no reason to give up on human flourishing <laughs> and, and individual sovereignty. So perhaps we can finish it off with a positive scenario. Flip side, if everything goes well and we actually make progress on interoperability, on usability, we have more people that really have skin in the game and the development of these technologies. Where do you think we could be in like about five years or so? Like what's a kind of like existential hope scenario? That that is well, not a utopia, like it's something we want we, yeah. we should be able to reach, but just a light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, so I, I view some trends as, i.e., in the future, most markets will be digital markets. And in the future, if to an increasing amount, most things that are traded on those markets themselves will be digital objects. And so if we are successful in building what what I've been spending the last 10 years building, then we will have fair markets that don't depend on institutions for those, for we will have for, for the largest chunk of the global, right? That's the opportunity. The opportunity is, and that's what I think is like the once in maybe a thousand years or maybe once in history of civilization opportunity to like work on secure private digital markets is that like we are at the cup of, cusp of this transition, we can get it right now, and we can make a system that depends on in economic incentives, distributed systems, cryptography, um, to give people access to fair digital markets, and that's that's the core core goal. And I think it's I think it I do think it's realistically achievable. Like we are we are not that far away. Yeah. And Sounds like we've come full circle. Fair digital markets is a point that we started the conversation with. Just to kind of like bring the point home, why do fair digital markets rely on privacy? So, well, everyone, in order to arrive at prices, like price things correctly, and thus without being able to price things correctly, you can't coordinate economic activity at scale, right? Like prices are the information sharing mechanism between parties and economy. And so if you don't have the ability to to um cons to have privacy for your strategy for like, participating in the market, what you buy, when you sell, at what price, at what quantity, or in more co more complex semantics, like the full set of conditions that you would require to, to complete a contract, et cetera. That if you don't have privacy for these things, now, basically, it's basically the best capitalized actor wins, uh, right? And control, and you end up in this sort of economy that's distorted by the domination of a single. And so, and it's important to realize that, so like for advertising, for digital advertising, we have this, we've had this system by which there basically been only two or three actors, Google, Facebook, who've operated these markets. They've operated markets where they had they themselves had 100% visibility into these markets. And right now there's a fascinating antitrust lawsuit against Google, which basically said, accuses them of manipulating the, the ad auction prices for on, at scale, right? And, but in order to even bring that lawsuit, you required a bunch of firms that actually are in competition with each other to like painfully collect and coordinate data and give it to the Department of Justice to even accuse Google of it because Google, like Google saw everything and, and all the other, and only had little pieces of the puzzle, right? In a world where we had private blockchains, you could have a private digital ads market 
where you don't aren't relying on on Google or anyone else to potentially manipulate the functioning of those markets, right? Where it's like the code itself makes guarantees and the math itself provides guarantees that like prices would be fair or that like your trading strategy would not be revealed to your counterparty. You know, that like when you like make a sealed bid auction, the only person, only entity that can open that sealed bid is is you, is you at your discretion. Like these things are possible. And it is a enormous opportunity to try to like try and get this because right now, okay, so advertise the advertising market is already hundreds of billions of dollars. It is a huge market. It has a huge impact on our society to begin with. But like that's a fraction of what it will be in 10, 15, 20 years, right? Like digital markets will become, will probably be how like more and more human, all economic activity is coordinated. I think this was a really crisp articulation of why fair markets will and digital privacy. And I think we should totally leave it at that. Thank you so, so much for joining. It was a real, real pleasure. Thanks everyone for asking wonderful questions. Yeah, thanks for the fantastic work that you do. And we're really, really delighted to have had you on and look forward to just following your work. Maybe close it out with how can people follow you? How can people learn more about your work? I'm Z-M-A-N-I-A-N on Twitter or Blue Sky or Farcaster. I don't know, I'm like on a lot of different services. And that's probably the best place. I'm the co-founder of a protocol called Sommelier, sommelier.finance. I have a, I work on a infrastructure provider called Occlusion. And I, I primarily am associated my work on, on Cosmos, which is a blockchain protocol. So, yeah. I'm kind of in many places at once. A whole menu of possibilities. Thank you so, so much, Zaki. This was really great. Thanks, everyone. And I hope to see you for the next one. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks a lot.